And now that the recording's in progress, I will turn this over to Suba Sadi, one of our AARP Virginia Community Ambassadors. Suba, I'm done, it's all yours. <laughs> Thank you, Trudy. Uh, let me extend my warm welcome to everybody that's tuning in today. Uh, I am Suba Sadi, as Trudy said, I am a volunteer community ambassador of the ARP here in Virginia, Northern Virginia to be exact. From our earliest beginnings, ARP has championed lifelong learning. That's why ARP is thrilled to bring you our third year of Tuesday Explorers, a lifelong learning program offered every Tuesday from January through the end of April at three o'clock Eastern time for Curious Explorers. For more than 60 years, ARP has been a wise friend and fierce defender, helping individuals to ensure that their money, health, and happiness live as long as they do. AARP has earned a reputation as a wise friend and fierce defender through trusted information, tools, and advocacy designed to protect the health and financial security of older Americans and empower them to choose how they live as they age. By promising, promising to act as a wise friend and fierce defender, AARP is helping people who are 50 plus and their families feel confident in control and secure as they age. As a wise friend in your corner, ARP helps you protect yourself and your loved ones from fraud, get healthy and stay healthy, care for loved ones, make connections, plan a trip, learn new technologies, attend a class, and have fun like we're going to do today with our Tuesday Explorers program. I hope you will continue to take advantage of these opportunities and more. So it's my pleasure to introduce our guest today. Jim Lewis has been with us and offered his time and expertise since Tuesday Explorer started. So glad we found him. So a little bit about Jim Lewis. He's a noted local historian and lecturer who focuses primarily on the American Civil War and World War II. He has also ventured into local col colonial era history, as well as the Cold War, and such electric topics that include his drop dead gorgeous presentation. In addition, many have attended one of his local Civil War tours, most notably, no, most notably the Hunter Mill Road Corridor in historic Centerville. His efforts have been recognized by his Lord Fairfax designation by the Hunter Mill District. Finally, he has authored more than 30 historical markers. So it in, indeed gives me great pleasure to recognize Jim Lewis. And Jim, the screen is yours, sir. Thank you, Suba. I appreciate it and good to be back with AARP. Um, this is probably going to be about an hour presentation. So uh, without further ado, there's a lot to cover, but uh, I think you will appreciate and enjoy. Hopefully there'll be some information here that will be new to you also. Although many people are aware of D-Day, uh, there's just a lot of items that took place that are associated with that particular effort. So anyway, this particular uh, presentation focuses on the incredible obstacles our men had to overcome on Omaha Beach during the D-Day landings, June 6, 1944. Their story is intermixed with the largest single-day amphibious ass assault in history. The numbers are staggering as the Allies would land, land over 150,000 brave young soldiers from the United States, United Kingdom, and Canada in a bold strategy to push the Nazis out of Western Europe and turn the tide of the war for good. They were supported by 11,500 aircraft, making 14,500 sorties in a single day and 196,000 men manning nearly 6,000 ships, including 702 warships. Now, before I move on, I just want to point out this photo right here. This is colorized. I would think most everybody has seen this in black and white. It was on Life magazine. It's iconic. However, I just a little bit of information on this. This photo was taken at 7.40 a.m. local time in France on D-Day. And it is the, uh, the, uh, our boys going on to the Easy Red, Easy Red sector on Omaha Beach. So without further ado, 
Let's set the stage a little bit for this. Anticipating the inevitable attack from the island of Great Britain, Hitler had ordered the construction of the Atlantic Wall on March 23, 1942. This wall spanned 3,000 miles from Norway down to Spain and it included 300,000 troops on that line. It was the el most elaborate sectors faced the English Channel. The wall featured multiple strong points. They were known as Widerstandest. And uh, when you see, and you'll hear later on in the presentation, WN, that stands for these Widerstandest. In essence, they were resistance nets. And uh, so that's where they put their strongholds. Th they incorporated an interlocking fire system up and down the beaches, maximizing the kill zone and embrasure walls, which suppressed flash from gunfire. The fortifications were made of thick concrete reinforced with steel, known today as rebar. Here's an example of one of those WNs, if you will. This is WN 65 on Omaha Beach. November 43, about six, seven months before D-Day, Hitler was disappointed with the pace of the construction of this wall. It was only one half done. So he brought in the famed Erwin Rommel to turbocharge this effort. He proceeded to build 15,000 fortifications, most were included machine guns, which were faster and easier to construct. By D-Day, there were over 6 million mines, 500,000 obstacles, and 3,008 guns, and by guns, I'm talking cannons, placed in Northern France. He, the wall wasn't finished, but it still remains the most formidable defensive line ever built. Two of the most feared guns throughout the war were the omnipresent, were omnipresent at Omaha Beach. This is the 88. You had to have heard of this. Simply the most devastating gun of the war, and it was used throughout the war it was originally a high velocity anti-aircraft gun that fired 15 to 20 rounds per minute. It was so versatile though, that it was reconfigured into anti-tank guns and incorporated in artillery weapons. Here's the Tiger VI, and there was a King Tiger called the VII, and this incorporated the 88 right here. Here's our Sherman tank. So you get a feel for the difference in the tanks. And um, it could, this gun in this tank could knock out any Allied tank up to 2,000 yards, which is over just over a one mile away. Now, this right here is the most devastating machine gun during the war. It's the MG-42. It fired up to 1,500 bullets per minute or 25 bullets per second, twice our American Browning machine gun. The projectiles traveled at about 2,000 miles per hour. It was nicknamed and had a lot of nicknames, but most knew it as Hitler's buzzsaw or zipper. And that's because you couldn't hear a single bullet being fired. The Allies were well aware of the wall and had reconned it for months. They understood the task and had planned meticulously two years for the invasion. It was a Herculean logistical endeavor, and it included a massive deception plan, which was known as Op Operation Fortitude, complete with America's most iconic general, Patton, commanding a phantom army. The potential invasion dates were only a precocious few because of the requirements. It had to have, and we were looking for clear skies and a full moon, which would enable our airborne and glider missions, as well as facilitating the necessary air support. Low winds and calm seas. 
to enable safe transport of our troops ashore. And finally, a low tide at dawn. So when our troops approach the beaches in order to expose and avoid the elaborate underwater system of obstacles installed by the Germans, particularly at Omaha Beach. More on that shortly. Allied, meter, Allied military leaders knew that casualties might be staggeringly high, but it was the cost they were willing to pay in order to establish a military stronghold in France. Days before the invasion, General Dwight Eisenhower was told by a top strategist that the paratrooper casualties alone could be as high as 75%. So as a result of that, in 1944, early in the year, from June to May, we doubled our manpower, we meaning the Allies, in England to over one and a half million men. This uh, dramatically increased, increased their war material effort too. And I'm talking about 137,000 Jeeps, trucks, half tracks, more than 4,000 tanks and fully tracked vehicles, 3,500 artillery pieces, Again, 12,000 aircraft, 16 million tons of supplies to feed and supply the men. Okay, this is Normandy right here. And that's the English Channel out here. And here are the sectors. Uh, and you can see Utah, Omaha, Gold, Juno, and Sword. The Americans were tasked with these two sectors, Omaha and then Utah over on this side. Now, I've also encircled a few areas of interest, of which one that I'm going to just comment on briefly today, I'm not going to get into it very deep, Point de Hoc, which is the most visited location over there. And uh, folks had asked, you know, about going over there on a trip. You cannot go over there and not visit Point de Hoc. It is unbelievable what occurred there. So Omaha was one of five beaches facing the English Channel. And it was formerly part of the Omaha invasion area, uh, which included the promontory, promontory point, again, Point de Hoc. And the... Uh, the landings were necessary in on Omaha to connect or enable disable German defenses from port on basin over to this is the Vyer River right here. So as you'll notice right here, as you look at this, Omaha is by far and away the widest sector. And that's where the Americans are going to land, and they're going to be responsible for that. Over here is uh, the Brits came in at Gold, and the Canadians primarily came in at Juno, and Sword was a British operation also. So the primary objective of all this was to put 34,000 Americans ashore by nightfall and secure a beachhead five miles deep, again, between these two locations. That was the focus. Omaha was the responsibility of the U.S. First Army under this fellow right here, Omar Bradley, Lieutenant General. And uh, I mentioned earlier Point de Hoc. You're going to hear about this fellow again when I briefly discuss Point de Hoc. This is uh, Lieutenant Colonel James Rutter. And he was one of the most, World War II, most decorated men during the entire war. The sea transport, man, mine sweeping, and a naval bombardment force would be provided predominantly by the United States Navy and Coast Guard, with contributions from the British, Canadian, and French, Free French navies. They targeted the landing. There were two waves. The first wave was dubbed H hour by the Americans at 6.30 a.m. The second wave over here, the Brits and the Canadians at 7.30 a.m. Okay, 
Omaha, let's hone in on it. Omaha was different from all the other beaches in a number of respects. First of all, I mentioned earlier, it was very wide. It's six miles wide, six miles. And it was wide enough to land two regiments side by side with armor in front. It also had a shallow but extensive tidal range. Look how long this is. And it was as a result, uh, it was great for landing craft while avoiding U-boats. So that's one of the reasons we targeted this beach. Now, this is critical. The low tide, which was H hour, that's when we landed. The beach depth was just over 300 yards, approximately three football fields, but it was still deep enough to drown. High tide, which was three hours later, the beach depth, depth shrank to 20 yards. Here you go, this is high tide. So you get the drift. That's all that was left three hours later. This right here would later come back to bite our boys. In addition, natural elements would also hinder American efforts. The western third of the beach was backed by a seawall 10 feet high, and the whole beach was overlooked by cliffs 100 feet high. There you go up there. Here's the seawall right here. Allied planters expected Omaha Beach would prove to be the most difficult landing of the Normandy invasions, particularly with the dizzying array of obstacles that Rommel had ordered position there. After having negotiated these obstacles, the only way or only a cover for our boys would be a natural embankment, no more than three, three feet high, formed out of shingle. This is shingle <laughs> right here. These are small to mid-sized cobble that had been washed ashore for a millennia by the waves of the English Channel. And just beyond this embankment lay no man's land. Bleak sand three to 400 yards deep with no protection and German machine guns, that MG-42, they're everywhere. The nests were situated in the bluffs to sweep the beach. Now, I'm just starting on the obstacles. But first, a point that's important. Omaha Beach reminded Rommel of the successful Allied landings in Salerno in 1943. Hence, he put an extra effort, an extra focus, on building up the defenses here, which would prove to be formidable. Between Rommel's efforts and the natural elements, our losses on Omaha would dwarf those on the other beaches. Okay, here's the assault sectors. I mentioned uh, you've got your uh, 116th and 16th Regiment and everybody, each sector had names. Remember I mentioned the uh, WNs? being a Winterstone's Nest uh, 72, remember that one. Virville sur Mir, that's kind of in the middle of the action, if you will. And I'm gonna describe something that occurred here in just a few minutes. St. Laurent and then Colville. So the defensive the strategy was a little bit conflicted uh, by the Germans because there was a big argument between Rommel and Gerd von Rundstadt, who commanded the uh, west sector, west section of the German defense. Uh, Rommel said, you gotta beat them at the beaches. You gotta bulk the beaches up. If you lose that, then it's over. Rundstadt was old school. He's 69 years old and he said, we have to concentrate, maintain a concentrated uh, defensive force. So we let them land basically, and then we attack in mass. Rommel knew from his North Africa experience that more than likely the Germans would never get to the beaches in time, which is exactly what did occur. So what Hitler did, he got involved as he did with everything. He had the medal 
<laughs> and he wanted direct control of the reserves also. So what he did, he ordered a compromise, which diluted both strategies. And his positioning some near the beaches, which he gave some of the uh, units to Rommel, and then the rest of them were just outside Paris, 100 miles from Omaha Beach, and that was, became problematic. Okay, here are what is known as the draws. The draws uh, are ravine-like passages through the bluffs that would allow for vehicles to arrive. These things are critical. Now, here's the Veerville draw right here. Remember that WN-72 I pointed out earlier? And on the other side was WN-71. So the Germans had put together fortifications. They knew these draws were going to be attractive. This is the draw for Veerville right here. And there's WN-72 right here. Over here is Colville draw. And this has been paved since. Uh, and that's... WN62 right here. So they're right up against the beach. And I wanted to make sure you're aware of that. There are five of these draws. And um, two dirt roads, uh, two were dirt roads leading to the villages of uh, Colville and St. Laurent. And the other two were only dirt paths, quite frankly. So anyway, just remember the draws. Okay. Here's what Rommel did. <laughs> I'm just gonna rock and roll right through this. Here's the litany of obstacles our boys had to deal with. On Omaha Beach, first of all, Belgian gates. Here it is. These things would float and you could attach three together. And what would happen, it would act just like a spider grabbing a prey. So if a tank or anything hard hit it, it would wrap itself around whatever had touched it. Okay, a little bit further up, you got your teller mines. Here they are. And this is a little bit larger uh, view of what's up top here. And uh, teller mines, this uh, was a mushroom, what they called a mushroom. It had 12 pounds of TNT, and it was designed for high tide. If anyone sailed over the Be Belgian gates, so if you got around this, you were going to be hitting this stuff. Well, we're not done yet. So let's just say you get through this. Well, you got to run through, get through now the ramps, which are basically tripods with blades. <laughs> they either, Germans either put teller mines up top here to blow the undersides of a boat apart, or they put razor or uh, saw blades. This one happens to be a saw blade that you're seeing. And again, it would rip open the hull of a landing craft. Now, let's just say you were able to get through this. Then you had to go, and if particularly you're a tank, circumvent this. These were Czech heads hogs, and they were anti-tank and movable. They were very much like a toy jack. So if a tank hit it and it bounced off, it would just roll elsewhere and it was still usable. Well, if you got through the Czech hedgehog, hedgehogs, you had to run through these babies. And uh, that is the uh, called the tetrahydras. And these things were buried in the beach. The bottoms you can't see because they're buried in the beach. And if a tank hit this, it was over. They wouldn't explode. It just wouldn't let you move. You could not move. So that's the litany going through the hedgehogs. Now, we're not done yet. This is a little piece here that you had to kind of deal with. Two rows of barbed Constantino wire up to 10 feet tall were strewn up and down the beach, the beach and they were intertwined with mines in all, 3,700 obstacles, hedgehogs, and stakes with teller mines, plus 17,000 mines, or an obstacle every, or mine every two yards were present on Omaha Beach. Now, I'm sure you're getting a drift. This is not going to be a cakewalk. Up the cliffs, 
<laughs> just beyond the seawall. You've got uh, these uh, concrete pill boxes. And guess what's in there? Most of the time, it's those MG42s, Hitler's buzzsaw, and anti-tank guns right here. Well, a little bit further up the cliffs, you've got the steel reinforced concrete bunkers protecting the 75 millimeter. And you remember me mentioning that little gun called the 88. Yep, 88s were everywhere here. Now, I just want to give you a feel of what this looked like. And this is a view of Omaha Beach, two and a half months called D-Day plus 75, 75 days after D-Day. This is what Omaha Beach looked like. <laughs> Unbelievable. So, and if you look over here, you still have your hedgehogs and tetrahydras are still noticeable on the beach. So it kind of gives you a feel of the litany of what our boys had to deal with. Okay, as a result of Rommel's concerns, Omaha, as I meant, it was the most fortified beach, had 13 strong points, remember the WNs, which included six concrete bunkers with 75 millimeter uh, plus artillery with the 88s, 120 of those MG42s, 18 anti-tank guns, six turrets embedded in the ground, six mortar pits, and 35 rocket, rocket launchers, all designed to trap our boys on the beach. And right here, when we were over in Normandy, went up to this enclosure, and this is the fortification, if you will, and up there was this gun. 88. And what could it see? That view. That's all they could shoot at. They couldn't turn their gun and shoot out to the ocean. They couldn't shoot anywhere else. They were going to shoot up and down this sector of Omaha Beach. All the guns were pre-calibrated on certain positions or portions of the beach. So, and here's one of the uh, concrete casemates uh, and a pillbox. You can, this is uh, interesting. This pillbox got hit a few times, but that's what they were in. And many times it had machine guns in here too. Okay, so despite such optimism, concern for the English Channel's violently erratic weather patterns was always prevalent. May 1944 had been, it'd been calm settled conditions, but then the weather unexpectedly changed early June. A cold front passed over the English Channel, bringing strong winds and extensive low cover, low cloud cover. This was a major concern as June 5th was the date that was targeted for D-Day. However, uh, supposedly, with it, it had because it was targeted, it supposedly had the necessary astronomical conditions. And uh, but if the attack did not occur during the first week of June, it would have to be delayed a minimum of two weeks. And Ike was absolutely paranoid about us being able to keep this quiet for two weeks longer. On June fourth through the fifth, the weather deteriorated significantly. German forecasters themselves were predicting that the rough seas and gale force winds were unlikely to weaken until mid-June. After Ike met with his senior officers to discuss options late in the evening of June 4, he decided to delay D-Day 24 hours. Despite such optimism, concern for the English Channel's violently erratic, uh, excuse me. So this is what happened, and this is a view of the weather deterioration that took place. Well, let me go back, excuse me. So, final plans for the crushing firepower to be brought to bear directly on enemy positions before the landings, basically the action would flow as follows. Excuse me, let me back up a second on this. 
I want you to take a look at this. This is Utah Beach. And what happened here was that here's Rommel with his wife. June 5th, Rommel looked out and the Germans had pulled their boats in. But it was so violent out there in the ocean. So Rommel decided, I'm going to go to Berlin and for my wife's birthday. And guess what he took? What was the prize, the prize present that he gave his wife? And it was Parisian shoes of all things. So, but before what he did, when he left, he ordered the flooding of all the land over in Utah Beach. And this would come back to bite our airborne boys big time, as most of the injury, uh, the deaths that were incurred on Utah Beach were our airborne that dropped and drowned in these waters. Anyway, final plans. Okay, I've got this a little bit out of work. But, uh, okay, final plans called for crushing uh, the firepower, uh, for crushing firepower to be brought to bear directly on enemy positions before the landings. Basically, the action would flow as follows. June 5th, 6th, midnight, we'd do airborne drops. And that's where our boys went into the water. And they were tasked with seizing the strategic bridges, crossroads, and road hubs, uh, which all were intended to inhibit any kind of Nazi response. At first light, the U.S. Army Corps would saturate bomb German coastal positions in Normandy in an effort to soften them up before the infantry landings. Once the bomber crews had done their jobs, the Allied ships would swing into action, pounding coastal defenses into submission supposedly. Landing craft, rocket platforms, would then contribute their, their firepower in the form of rocket salvos, intended to keep the enemy hunkered down while their landing craft sped to, uh, sped to shore. With any luck, the shell-shocked German defenders would be quickly overrun by Allied troops landing simul simultaneously on five beaches. 6.30 a.m., Again, was the targeted arrival time on Omaha Beach. Tanks would arrive shortly thereafter, providing support on the beaches, supposed to be a tank every 50 yards. Allied intel had indicated that the German 716th Division on Omaha Beach, an un unexperienced second-rate unit, was composed primarily of conscripts uh, from occupied parts of Poland and Russia, and whose morale was believed to be poor, would put up only token resistance. Our boys had been assured that the enemy positions would be pulverized before they made their assault. The quote was, everything would be blasted to smithereens, a pushover. Okay, despite such, such optimism, concern for the English Channel uh, was with the weather, as I mentioned previously, was a major, major concern. And I had gone through this with regards to what happened with Rommel on the 5th. Now, Murphy's Law, we're talking D-Day. Meanwhile, and just before D-Day started, let me tell you a little bit about the trip from England over. The overnight transit across the English Channel had not been smooth. Many of our infantrymen had suffered hours of seasickness, exasperated by well-intentioned, hearty pre-battle meal in an attempt to boost morale. They had a fine cuisine. It was a, it was a smorgasbord and a feast. Now, let me let, give you a feel for what our boys were served. Steak, pork chicken, sausages, beans, bacon, eggs, ice cream, candy, donuts, all washed down with that infamously very, very good army military coffee. So they had this in them as they're coming across. Anyway, also a number of our men preparing for the landings at that time 
were deathly afraid of water. Hence, several prematurely inflated their life vest and got caught in the ship's hatches, thereby impeding everyone else's trek to the main deck, where they were to load onto the Higgins landing boats. They're also called LCVPs. Uh, within hours of the 101st and 82nd airborne drops at 12 a.m., most of our casualties in Utah, again, would occur because of drownings and Rommel's ordered released water. The problem is, the biggest problem is, our boys did not have a single quick release mechanism. The Brits did. We, our boys had to, they had three latches that they had to push for the gear to come off. And that was a real problem um, and caused a lot of deaths, quite frankly. The events now that I'm going to go through proceeded to worsen. <laughs> so as if what I've just discussed is not bad enough, it's going to get real bad now. The, and this is the equivalent of Murphy's Law on steroids. At 44.30 a.m., the first suicide wave, which was the nickname that everybody gave to it, was boarded, the LCVPs, uh, and uh, again, the Higgins boats. Now, the Higgins boats was named after a uh, Bayou rum runner, by the way. His name was Andrew Jackson Higgins. Great story about him. But here's the problem. When they boarded those boats, the weather was not good. Okay, everybody thinks D-Day. Okay, the weather got better. Barely. It was horrific. 24 knots wind. The temperature outside was about 50 degrees and the water was cold. It was about 50 degrees also. So the conditions that our men faced on June 6th, D-Day in the morning was horrific. The waves were seven foot high and filled with diesel smoke, soaked, seasick, and receiving income and fire. Many jumped into the water and drowned by way of the weight of their equipment. At 5.30 a.m., the deafening naval barrage began. At 6.10 a.m., 446 planes dropped 13,000 bombs, billed as the greatest exhibition of precision bombing in history. Problem, poor visibility and extensive low cloud cover. They were supposed to use radar, but the radar uh, Navy didn't trust because of the cloud cover. So the pilots were told to delay their drops a few seconds. Therefore, what they ended up doing was dropping their bombs beyond the beaches. Result, not one single bomb hit the guns overlooking the beach or the beach itself. Why was it important for the bombs to hit the beach? Well, our boys were depending upon craters to be created on the beach so they could hide from the gunfire. There are no craters on the beach. This was D-Day's single biggest failure because of zero craters, quite frankly. And it was the entire air drop if you will, that uh, was the biggest disaster. Anyway, 10 minutes later, 6.20 a.m., 14,000 rockets are launched. Most fell short of their targets into the water. When the smoke from the bombers and naval guns lifted, it revealed the complete failure of the Allies to soften up German uh, positions, an unexpected and ominous development. 6.30 a.m., now remember, this is H hour, right? We're supposed to be landing on the beach. Came and went as strong winds and tidal currents left to right resulted in almost every unit arriving late and missing their assigned landing targets. So it's not shaping up to be a good day. In addition, these babies, they're called their special amphibious tanks, in particular, were nowhere to be found because the tanks were supposed to save the day on the beach. This is a duplex drive DD tank, 
also nicknamed Donald Duck. Uh, they were modified Sherman tanks by the Brits for the use on D-Day. They were outfitted with these skirts, canvas skirts, to keep the water out. And you'll notice there were two propellers. So they could transport on land and in the water. And here they are being tested. And here's a problem. This thing's being tested in water that's not the kind of water that occurred on Omaha Beach or off Omaha Beach on June 6th, not even close. Hence, when the DD tanks began launching from the LCTs, and that's a uh, landing craft tanks, they foundered in the high waves and sank. Lucky crew members climbed out of the tanks before they sank, others simply perished. On Omaha East, 27 out of 29 of these tanks were lost. Only two made it to the beach. A handful full landed on Omaha West only because a number of quick thinking officers now ordered them and their LCTs to land on the beach. You can't let them out, out in the water. They're gonna go down. In addition, only three of these babies, three of the 16 bulldozer tanks had landed, could be put into action. Basically, these are bulldozers that are armored and they're going to move things around. Those hydro tetrahydras and all that, they're going to clear ways and they're also going to work on the roads to get our troops off the beach and up into the cliffs. So things are not looking good. Well, I'm just going to mention one particular uh, regiment, if you will. This is 116. They called the Bedford Boys. Most people were aware that are familiar with uh, D-Day are aware of this this unit. And this unit uh, arrived. It was the only one that was on time and on target. And it was a sign that in Vereville, if you remember me early on. I mentioned Remember Deerville, it was uh, on the left-hand side of the beaches. And here are the boys at Camp Hill, AP Hill in Virginia. Now the Bedford, that's in Virginia. There's another uh, National Guard unit and that's what it was in Roanoke also. However, when they landed, the adjacent companies were bad, badly out of position as the men of Company A uh, prepared to go ashore, they would do so without adequate flank support. The beaches were now defended by a well-entrenched and trained veteran German 356th Infantry Division, including some other hotshots, if you will. So the, the beaches and the, the fortifications were not weak links at all as far as the fighters. This 352nd, they were core boys, and they were some of the toughest German units uh, on the coast. And they had fought in the uh, the Eastern Front against the Russians, so they knew what the deal was. Anyway, within 10 minutes of stepping onto the beach, Company A was essentially destroyed, losing 96% of their unit. Only 18 survived. And uh, they lost, again, 92% of their unit. Because of this, after the war, it had lost, they had figured out that this particular town, community, had lost more per capita than any other community in the nation. Therefore, that's where today's National D-Day Memorial is in Bedford, Virginia. If you haven't been there, it's something to go see. It's fantastic, and it's a, a sad reminder of what did occur. Anyway, as the other units approached and landed on Omaha Beach, they faced the same horrific firepower. Their survivors jumped into bitterly cold, chin high water and struggled ashore, many arriving without their weapons and or their equipment. With no air or tank cover, our boys realize it's gonna be a real bad day. Fully exposed, the beach becomes a killing field, simply. To survive, our boys had to crawl between the obstacles, which you'll see here. And it, it was just that bad up and down the beach. 
Over here, this is telling. As a result of German incoming, several LCVPs, Higgins boats, arrived empty. And that meant that everybody in here was dead. And this is an example of one of those Higgins boats arriving. Okay, I'm just going to touch base point uh, touch base on uh, point the hawk real quick. This is where you got to go. <laughs> okay. Anyway, our rangers were assigned to scale these cliffs. These are hundred foot cliffs. Up here was point the hawk, and supposedly there were six big German guns that were also beaded in on sites on both Utah Beach and Omaha Beach. They had uh, uh, Germans that were up here with uh, binoculars and all that, sighting in what was going on and calling in orders for the guns to uh, take out whoever was on the beach. So anyway, um, the... Uh, the the rangers arrived 70 minutes late and in the wrong area so it was an absolute mess but here are the rangers they did land and here's the boys going up those cliffs how they were they going to get up those cliffs with these rocket propelled uh grappling hooks and the problem is they had 60 of them which they were counting on only 19 of them worked because the rest of them had gotten soaked out in the water and the waves and everything coming in. Incredibly, the first man scaled the cliff in minutes, and in small groups, they were able to get up top here. What they found, though, was that the big guns had been moved, which blew everybody away, supposedly. There were a number of people that were aware of that, but they didn't tell the troops that scaled these cliffs. So they had to go looking for the guns, which they did find, and they took them out, um, blew up with grenades and that type of thing. However, what occurred up here, the worst was yet to come. It wasn't scaling these cliffs and dealing with all this. Two days later, for the next couple of days, they faced a horrendous counterattack by the Germans. In essence, bottom line, the Rangers held out for two days until reinforcements arrived. 135 Rangers were lost, which was a 60% casualty rate. Only 90 out of 225 survived. So back to Omaha Beach, 7.30 a.m. A third of the first wave were casualties. Here you can see them. Now, these are the veterans. This is the first uh, infantry. They had fought and done battle over in Africa, but here they are up against the wall. Uh, by 8.30 a.m., all landing had ceased at Omaha Beach, and our tro troops uh, were left on their own. At 9.30 a.m., remember I mentioned the tide? What's H hour? 6.30. It's 9.30. It's over. It's high tide. Therefore, the depth of the beach is only 20 yards. So these boys are crammed up against the seawall because that's all they've got, or they have to go back in the water. So it's horrible. And they're getting incoming from both sides, up and down the beach from the 88s. And of course, the uh, MG42s are after them. At 9.30, excuse me, 10.30 a.m., the invasion at Omaha Beach was collapsing. Omar Bradley and some of his cohorts were absolutely considering abandoning in the beachhead. A quality found on the battle emerged. And this is what changed everything, bravery. And an example of this is this fellow right here. This is General Norman Dutch Coda, Assistant Division Commander of the 29th. And he is known as the hero of Omaha. Now look at this guy. He's the first American general with the highest rank and he was the oldest at 51 to set foot on Omaha Beach. He realized when he got there that this was a defining moment of his career, and he acted, much like Patton did at the Bulge and Bastogne and everything. Exactly. Okay, now's my time. So he has three objectives. Inject leadership, get off the beach, and attack. 
So he strides down the beach <laughs> with an unlit cigar, inspiring the men to blow through to those two lines of concertino barbed wire. Strategy was to use these Bangalore pipes. They're basically pipe bombs. And he is credited, and he did inspire the men to break through and cut through these, line, these wires and get to the cliffs. He is credited with two famous quotes. Well, and here it is. Well, God damn it then, Rangers lead the way. And that is today's Ranger motto. And his other one was, gents, we're being killed on the beaches. Let us go inland and be killed. Here he is receiving an award afterwards from Omar Bradley. Fittingly, he lived to see his D-Days recreated in the longest day. Now, I mentioned him going up and down the, the beach like with a cigar. He was like Clint Eastwood to a degree with that cigarette. They had a stogie or whatever. Guess who played uh, Coda in the longest day? There you go. That's Coda, Robert Mitchum. By 10.30 a.m., incredibly, a number of Americans were already up on the bluffs against all odds and seemingly an impregnable, impregnable defensive system, which took four years to build, was breached in only four hours. By noon, learning that several ad hoc groups had infiltrated the, the German defense, Bradley reconsidered and with naval assistance, the Allied forces eventually exploited the penetrations. Success had emerged when individuals improvised and made a difference. By nightfall, we held positions at Beerville, St. Laurent, and Colville. Nowhere near the planned objectives, but we had a toehold with our 34,000 troops. The German 352nd Division had lost 20% of its strength. More importantly, they had no reserves coming to back them up. By D-Day plus three, three more days, with continued perseverance, our boys met their objectives. Okay, so that's D-Day. Now, we suffered 4,700 casualties on the flats and bluffs of uh, Omaha Beach, a third of all the Allied losses on D-Day. 2,400 were killed in action. This epic struggle on Omaha Beach proved to be one of the costliest battles of World War II and helped set in motion an exorable chain of events that would lead to the collapse of the Third Reich. I don't know if you've ever seen this, if you've ever been over to uh, the American Cemetery, this was the first cemetery that was created within two days June 8th, this cemetery started to be worked on, and it is simply known as the St. Laurent Cemetery. Eventually, the other cemetery that everybody goes to today uh, was dedicated in 1956, but bottom line, they had to start burying our boys within what happened over the past 36 hours. So... And this photo was taken after the initial tombstones or whatever uh, markers were taken out and replaced with these white wooden crosses. Here's what the uh, American uh, cemetery looks like today. It's absolutely gorgeous, as you might expect. Here's a good example. I'm sure everybody's seen this. The place is immaculate. You could eat off of the grass. It's that good. At the very top here, in this section, this is the uh, uh, this is a uh, uh, basically a visitor center was opened in 2007, and this is the reflection pool with uh, the memorial right here, and inside here is this 22 foot bronze statue in the center of the memorial. Its inscription is this the spirit of American youth rising from the American waves. And inside here also are 1,557 names inscribed on the walls of the missing 
In other words, we never found the boys. We knew they were there because we had the dog tags and all of this. Okay, real quick. I want to have some fun with you. Let's do a trivia. Let's go left to right. I can't hear you, obviously, so I'm going to answer that. Eisenhower. This is Dick Winters. If anybody's ever seen The Band of Brothers, which was a very famous TV series, uh, he was the commander. This is the fellow who was the actor who played him. Okay, who's this? Nobody gets this. <laughs> uh, that's Bob Dole right here. Of course, everybody gets this fellow here, Jimmy Stewart. Now, he was the highest ranking actor in military history. He went from private to colonel, and when he retired, he was a brigadier general. All these people are like cheery, uh, excuse me, um, Purple Hearts and all of that. They're all very, very famous. These ladies right here who carried uh, the tune throughout the war and helped immensely uh, in the raising of war bonds is the McAndrew sisters. Ladies down here, they flew more hours than our fighter pilots flew their planes. And this is the WASP. And they were the ones that always were in charge of, they took over the planes and flew them back to the bases uh, for maintenance and things like that. So they were extremely involved and important. This fellow right here, Gunsmoke, that's James Arness. He had a purple heart and four bronzes. He got shot up at Anzio. By the way, who really limped on gun smoke? Because most people think it was Weaver, uh, you know, Dennis Weaver. Uh, it wasn't him. It was Arness. He got shot up at Anzio. If you ever watch gun smoke again and you ever see him walk, because they didn't make him walk very much because he was a hurt and puff. He's tall, six foot seven. But I've seen some episodes where I look specifically for his gait. And he's got a distinct limp when he walks. Okay, this fella here, anybody that's into baseball knows Ted Williams. Our Tuskegee boys, they were fantastic, noted, just full of uh, awards, if you will. They were tremendous. And they were as good as any unit, uh, flyer unit that we had in the war. Here's uh, the Riveter. And here's the original... Rosie the Riveter, right here, Geraldine Doyle, and she was a Michigan factory worker. Now, this lady, I wouldn't doubt you may not know who she is, but I guarantee you when I mention her name, you will. That's a Miss Alita Sullivan, and here she is reading a letter from FDR about the loss of her five sons at the Battle of Guadalcanal. Yep the five Sullivan boys. And she would serve on the home front as a model for stalwart sacrifice. This fellow right here, both of them, that's him during WW2, later on, Charles Durning. He had three Purple Hearts and a Silver Cross. And he was in the first wave on D-Day. He was the only survivor in his unit. And he was wounded, rehabbed. He also fought at the Battle of the Bulge. Now, you re may remember and recall him whenever he spoke at Memorial Day, and he spoke every Memorial Day he was around and capable of doing so, you would cry because he would recount his story and seeing all his brethren uh, shot up, quite frankly. Finally, this lady here, I'm sure you don't know who she is, but I have to point her out. First Lieutenant Surgical Nurse served aboard the USS Emily Weeder in both the Atlantic and Pacific theaters. Two silver stars with medals for the American, Asiatic, Pacific, European, African, Middle, Eastern campaigns and the Philippine liberation. She dined with Patton in Sicily during the invasion of Southern France. Okay, I'm sure you don't know, that's my mom right there. And there she is being chosen as Yank of the Week. She came from West Virginia um, and she is here 
noted, and this is what the local banks did, they would adopt someone for a period of time and they would use this to raise war bonds. Here she is, she was very involved with the honor flight program uh, that we still have continuing. This fellow right here, believe it or not, was 101 years old and she was an icon uh, in this effort and became basically the poster girl for the uh, for the honor flight program at Dulles Airport. We just put her up near the uh, the airplane. As the boys came out, they all flipped out over. And here's a fellow looking and saying, you know, I was in that campaign too. So there she is. And that is a wrap. So as we uh, as we look back over uh, D Day. It's uh, my intent to try and keep this in everybody's memory and hopefully educate others as to what our forefathers and ladies and women had to go through to give us the privileges that we have today that so many people really don't know about or don't appreciate. It. It's a shame. But anyway, I think this sums up the entire you know episode and the way the veterans felt. And he went back for a reunion. His name is uh, Bletlink. And um, uh, it's Major, Sergeant Major Robert Blatnick. And he went back during the reunion and he just dropped and he was using a walker and he just thanked and praised, you know, what happened here and that he was able to survive. But he also reminisced about, uh, you know, his brethren that did not make it. So I hope uh, that was informative and you enjoyed it. Okay. I think they did. We've got a couple of thank yous in the chat box and a very good program. And someone, I, oh, my scroll isn't working. There we go. Uh, we do have someone in the inter uh, audience that has visited uh, Point Duhok, Omaha Beach, the American Cemetery at Normandy as well. That's great. Those are the um, those are the best. I mean, there's a lot of other stuff there. You yeah. know, Europe has really preserved these uh, sites much more so than the Americans have done with a number of their sites. I know we've got Civil War battlefields and all of that, which are in many cases very well done. But over there, I mean, you absolutely see the craters and you see everything. Matter of fact, the concertina wire is still readily viewable over there. So they've even left those kind of details intact. Very good. Supa, I'm not seeing any questions at this point. Yeah, Just I'm not a either. a lot of thank yous to Jim. <laughs> yeah, I do want to give props to, uh, before uh, Jim asked the question who this person is, Donna did uh, come up with Bob Dole, Jim. Yes. <laughs> Congratulations, you're the first. <laughs> yeah. I like yeah. I was I was guessing in my mind, but I couldn't come up with that. Yeah. 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 Uh well anyway, let me make my co closing comments here. But uh behalf of ARP Virginia, truly like to thank uh Jim uh, Lewis for his excellent presentation today. His is always interesting and I always learn something. I thought I knew a lot about the actors who participated, but I never knew that uh, uh, one of them made the rank of uh, general. Uh, and that was truly amazing to learn. Um, but we'd love to get your feedback on today's program and ideas for future programs. In the chat box, you will see a link to a survey. Please click on the link and take a few moments to share your feedback with us. We'll also send this link in a follow-up email later today. Uh, our Tuesday Explorers, will, our programs will continue next week, and we invite you to join us. Uh, and then please look, of course, look at wwarp. I'm sorry, www.aarp.org forward slash Tuesday Explorer for information about the following program. Now, next week, we'll have another historian, a friend of Jim Lewis's, uh, Blaine uh, Amthor, who will provide an, a, a presentation on the U.S. Enterprise, which was America's most decorated warship uh, during World War II. And of course, in the chat box, you'll see a link to register our upcoming programs. As I said, when we started, Tuesday Explorers is a great way 
to find out about new things. Please pass this along to your friends and family. And the great thing again is, as I said, if you can't link in at three o'clock, you'll get the um, uh, recorded portion of this like you will get for Jim's presentation today. And you can watch it again, or you can watch it if you could not, uh, could not have made it to today's presentation. So um, until next time, we encourage you to stay curious and uh, keep exploring. And our thanks to Jim Lewis again. Thank you folks for joining us from all around the country.